we should start with having you introduce yourselves. Okay, I can start. Uh, my name is Erin Campbell. I'm a SLIM graduate from 2013, uh, the Oklahoma Park cohort. I'm currently a research librarian at the National Association of Insurance Commissioners. Um, I tell people I'm an insurance librarian. Um, and before that, I was a solo hospital librarian after right after grad school. And while I was in grad school, I worked in HR. So um, some experience hiring and interviewing and all that kind of stuff. So my name is Luis Coriano. I'm not in the library sector. Um, so it, it turns out like, um, so I'm an aerospace engineer, mechanical, master's in mechanical engineering. I worked for a company called Pratt & Whitney for 13 years. Um, I did design operations in the OEM manufacturing. I went into the overhaul manufacturing for jet engines. And then I went into customer service because it's like having too much engineering and technical background, you have to you kind of lose the touch for the people. So I, I was standing a two year rodeo uh, in charge of Asia and Europe to go ahead and um, be customers and kind of do deals. But then I came to Kansas City because an opportunity came up to run a small middle market company. So I left this significant company, which is about $12 billion. I came into a $100 million enterprise, but I was able to see the full business cycle. Um, and now in February, after four years with the company, um, I decided to build my own company. So I started my own company in February. And my full-time job is uh, I do consulting uh, for operations and top-line growth strategies for companies. And uh, my second um, element to it is I write proposals to purchase companies. That's Luis. So I'm Sandy Valenti, and um, as we have kind of have discussed here, I'm also a graduate from Emporia State. I got my doc in 2015. Uh, I have uh, eight years of IT experience with Emporia State, um, but actually my business man, I teach management now. Um, my business management predates my um, university days. I didn't start going to school, I just find someone until I was in my mid 40s, early to mid 40s. Um, previous to that, I did a lot of retail management. So I managed uh, Walmart stores in um, like 11 states at varying levels from all the way from a support manager to store manager. So I have had, I have interviewed literally thousands of people and worked with them, um, helping to improve them and our stores on the way. So. All right, well, I guess we'll get into the questions. So regarding job searching, and we've already kind of touched on this, but it'd be interesting to see in perspective. Uh, when should you follow up on the job application? Like time period to, to wait, the method that you use, like calling or emailing, what would be your advice on that? Well, this might be just me as a millennial, but please don't call me. <laughs> please send me an email. Um, I'm not a phone person. I don't like talking on the phone. I don't like doing business over the phone. I want something in writing that I can go back and look for later, go back and refer to later. I can keep records of. So I definitely prefer an email. And as far as timeline, um, are you asking like before you would get an interview, like submitting an application and then? Um, what you're I would assume it's before an interview. Like if you have, if you've applied, you haven't heard for a while. Yeah, I would say, as far as timeline goes, not the same day. You know, wait a couple of days, let them have a chance to respond to you. You know, give them um, maybe three days or so to give them a chance to review your resume. If you haven't heard anything in maybe a week, um, then I think that's an appropriate time to just say, hey, I just wanted to make sure you received this. Do you have any questions or, or any materials you're missing? That kind of thing. Uh, I, was, uh, I would just echo what she said at least give them a week, you know. And if you're gonna write a note, just write a note saying, hey, listen, I'm just trying to follow up in terms of to make sure you received the application and it did not get uh, lost in the system. Sometimes they get lost. So. Yeah, I think that's a good point. 
And sometimes I think you need to consider, someone else mentioned this in the last panel, you need to think about the context. So I mentioned we hired two faculty, new faculty members this semester. Um, the position was considered open until filled, and we collected resumes for more than a month. I have to say, though, that um, I chaired the committee, so I did most of the communication with the candidates. Um, I advised them up front, um, hello, I just want to let you know I've received all the materials that are needed to complete your packet. Um, and you know, I can't remember how I closed it, but I didn't say what they would hear from us, just that I had that just that their packet was complete. So I think you need to um, take a look at their uh, posting to see what their dates are uh, and give time. I think a week is kind of for me would be minimal. Um, uh, we had, oh, I think maybe 50 applications uh, for these two jobs that we hired for. And um, it does take time to go through them when you have a lot of them as a body. So, um, but I certainly wouldn't have had any issue with someone saying, checking in with me, except that, I mean, I kind of precluded the need for that by letting them know that their packets were complete, so. And the situation would be different. Like at my company, everything as far as hiring process goes through our HR department. Um, and so it's a little bit different if you're dealing with a recruiter, an HR recruiter, or if you're dealing with the person who's actually gonna be making the hiring decision. So you might keep that in mind as well. So how important is having an updated LinkedIn account for other social media, professional social media? First place I look when, yeah, I mean, too. I looked up everybody that we hired. You, you have to assume that when you go into that room, that person has done, they have checked your Facebook account if it's open, they have checked your LinkedIn, your Instagram, um, they do a lot of research. I mean, when I used to, when, when I was a vice president of operations, I will have my admin do, do all that research for me and give me a profile of this person so that I know more of that person that they will ever think I know. And I would not even share it with them just to make sure I know. I had an applicant one time for an internship put on his resume, he included his Twitter handle, his Instagram handle, his LinkedIn, all of that stuff. And because it was on the resume, I thought, well, this must be to supplement that, the information on his resume to inform me more about, and it was like tweets about music videos. It was like totally not, it's one thing to, you know, if you don't, if you leave it off a resume and someone still looks it up, that's one thing. But to put it on a resume, I'm going to expect that there's professional information on there or something that's going to inform me about your qualifications that you're bringing to the job. So don't put your social media information on your resume unless it's, unless it's relevant in some way to the position you're applying for. Yeah, that I, was I would agree with that, but I, but I would add, do anticipate that yes. all your side things. Yes. And do you recommend cold calling or sending an unsolicited resume? Or, do, or would you suggest that people wait until a job opportunity has arisen? So I'll say you have to, if your candidate wants, wants a job really badly in a specific sector or a specific company, first you can send a letter, follow up with an email, Prime the pump. So I would say cold calling sometimes can be mis mis um, misunderstood. But I would say if you're gonna finally call, I say, hey, listen, I'm just following up. I send you a letter of interest, and the letter I sent it two weeks ago. I just want to make sure you understand that I'm interested. But I would say prime the pump before you go ahead and really just make a cold call. That would be my recommendation. Well, and more than cold calling, like the way I got my the position I'm in now was um, I was a member of SLA. I am a member. I'm actually the president of our local Kansas Western Missouri chapter of SLA, which, by the way, has a great student membership program. Throw that plug in there. Uh, but I went to my very first uh, event. It was at a pizza place, and it was old members, new members. Um, and I met someone there. You know, I, I was I was still a student, I think, or maybe I just recently graduated, and just kind of made it known I'm, I'm looking uh, and I got connected with a person who um, 
she's retired now, but she's the person who hired me. Uh, she didn't have any open positions at that moment, but she anticipated that um, she'd have an internship open, open up um, in a number of months. And we exchanged information and I sent her an email. And then when the posting did become available, she already knew my name and my face. Um, and so, you know, it's four years later and here I am with a full-time job after that. So, um, I don't know about cold calling, but if you can make connections and build relationships before the job opens, that is going to be a huge thing. I mean, she, she's spot on. Um, I'll say, like, for me now, right, like, I look for any, any nonprofit organization, a professional nonprofit that is related to the market that I want to target. I will attend their networking events. I will start networking, building like that network, some relationships, and and I think you get way better results that way than a cold call or a letter or an email too. I really I don't have much to add there. I think that the uh, concept of networking um, is so important. Uh, as Robin said, it's a, a fairly close knit community, and. Uh, and it, it is a service-oriented community. So being involved in those ways and doing those things uh, will, will so reach so much farther down the line. And, and I just want to add that student memberships are much cheaper. Mm -hmm. So join now <laughs> and make those connections now because when you do graduate and you want to get continuing education, uh, grants from those organizations, a lot of times you will have to be a member for two to three years. So join early, make those connections now, and I will tell you, I totally agree with what you said. Find out what area you want to work in and make those connections, join those organizations, whether it's the college and library section or the uh, public library section or whatever, and, and meet those people. And if you don't want to work in Kansas, there's a 12 state regional um, Mountain Plains Library Association. It is a tight community. It's a small community, and you'll get to know people, and they'll get to know you, and you, and they'll know your qualifications, and 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 they want to help you succeed. They want for you to be a great librarian. Yeah. And once you go to one of these networking events, they see that you care, and then it's like a tight family. So all of a sudden, you're part of that family, and next thing you know, people are trying to really just help you, they go above and beyond just trying to make sure they, they find a slot for you. Well, that kind of covers the next question on here, which was describe the importance of networking. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess kind of off of that, how early should you start networking or getting in contact with people if you're looking for a job? Five years ago. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, start as a student. Definitely. It, it will show the maturity. And if, if like, um, when you look at, like, uh, seasoned professionals, right, they all network. So networking at a very early stage, it shows that you, you get it. You understand. That's the livelihood. That's what you have to do. So I'll say as soon as you can. And sometimes there's a, a time commitment and a, and a money commitment involved, and sometimes you can get that paid back and sometimes you can't. But I'll just use uh, Brady as an example um, in terms of the fact that he's going to go present at this national conference, and that will put his name out there. People will remember that. So it's, if you can at all, I mean, you can always go state and local, move up to regional, but if you can get to the, if you can get to the ALA kind, kind of thing, it, it's just a win win. I'll have another little shameless plug here. Uh, the Kansas Western Missouri chapter of SLA has an annual conference in the fall, it's in October, uh, and we are have we have our call for proposals is open through next Thursday. Uh, it's a great little one day conference. It's pretty cheap. Maybe twenty. I don't think we set a price yet, but twenty bucks. Um, we're taking proposals for 10 minute lightning rounds or posters, or if you want to do a full 45 minute session, but it's a really, it's, it's, it's a fairly small group. It's not like a statewide conference. It's really just this kind of middle region of Kansas and Missouri, but, um, it's a, it's a welcoming place. It's a safe place to present a conference. There's already a number of students who have submitted, 
uh, session proposals. So that would be a great little, maybe some baby steps into, into the world of networking and librarianship and presenting. And by the way, I sent out a Facebook post this morning that I will buy lunch for everybody <laughs> who presents there and that is a student. And we're also looking at ways to help provide some financial support to those students that are members of Scala that are presenting at conferences as well. Because we, we recognize how important that is to do that kind of stuff now. Great. Well, and one thing is to think about going to a conference, even if there's an expense to you personally, even if you have to take a day off of work, even if you have to pay your own way, as an investment in your future. Um, that it's not just about, well, I can't afford to go to conference this year. Um, if you, can, if you can get a day off from work and you can go for one full day and introduce yourself to as many people as, as possible, um, go for it. Be visible. Also, there are a lot of scholarships out there for students to attend conferences, and I have taken advantage of those, I will say. <laughs> but everybody can, so go out and look for those opportunities. All right, so on to the interviews themselves. What's the best thing that you have seen at an interview? Enthusiasm, I would say. At least for me, was what is a significant, I'll say, point is when that person just crossed that door, you want to see energy and like positiveness, um, you want to really see that person that is giving you a good handshake, um, looking you at the eyes, not at the ceiling or staring at the floor. You really want to connect with that person that second. So like I'll say the first 15 seconds of, of knowing who's interviewing you, I think those are the most critical ones. Because either you're going to find out if there's chemistry or if there's no chemistry. It's a lot like a first date. It really is. <laughs> Interviewing is a lot like dating. It's blind date. Yeah, it's like a blind, on a blind date. It really is. Um, and, you know, I think it's ultimately about can your interviewer picture working with you um, and, and um, see well, you on a day to day basis. And also, I mean, I think equally important is can you work with that entity? Yes. I mean, it's not the interview process is not just for the hiring body. The interview process is for you as well because everything is not the best fit for you. So, okay. I will totally agree. Uh, there's organizations, even though they might be like the one you want to go for and the one you want to work for, but their culture may not fit. And if their culture doesn't fit you, I would just run away, literally. Because you're, gonna, you're not going to be a happy employee. So on the reverse of that, what's the worst thing that you've seen in an interview? Don't be late. Just don't. Yeah, so I had a person tell me that they hit two traffic jams, an accident, and um, that's why they couldn't make it on time. And I think that's fair to a point, but literally if that job is so important for you, you'll be there way ahead of time. Not five minutes before, not 30 minutes before, even if you have to wait in the parking lot for an hour. If that's that important for you, you literally need to do your homework ahead of time. Like telling them you couldn't find the parking lot, you couldn't find the room, you have to lay all this out way before, and it shows that you are a very complete professional, that you could plan, um, it, it says a lot. And like absolute worst case, at least call and say, hey, I've had this snag, they shut the highway down, or whatever it is, just call and say, give a heads up. I'd say the other thing, and we were kind of talking about this in the back during the break, um, make sure that you dress appropriately for the interview. There's a wide range of what is, is appropriate and what isn't appropriate, um, but you should know for the position that you are seeking. Uh, my son-in-law is a world builder. He makes video games. His business uniform is a graphic t-shirt and cargo shorts. That's what's accepted. That's what's common. That's what he would wear to an interview. It would not work in most other settings. You know? um, so you just need to always consider the context and 
don't walk in either on either end of the spectrum, either incredibly overdressed or in the t-shirt and cardigan shorts that we do. In most cases, they don't fit. I would like to add cat hair. Cat hair? <laughs> cat hair. Uh, or dog hair. I'm sorry, or, it's a big you know, <laughs> hair. I mean, it's just like a great looking suit and the person turns around and there's just hair all over it. That's a <laughs> total turn off for me. So, and that has happened in multiple libraries, in multiple interviews. So. I have to say, I mean, she, she's caught on. One of the things that really takes away, and you never know the other person on the other side, and she says, like, if they make sure you're, you're happy, make sure you're super clean. You have to make sure your hair is combed, your hair is washed, you have to ask a female, make sure your nails are all done. And even as a guy, too, you don't want any, any type of, um, I'll say, new and sauce to take away from the interview because i have seen almost about everything like you know people don't notice and you know, sometimes I have to tell them hey you know mike and just you can you head you know go to the bathroom you might want to clean this up but you just try to look as just clean because i think the point is that you'll never get the opportunity to clean up no one is going to say to you uh -huh. If we hire you and you wash your hair or whatever, you know, right. it is what it is. You just won't get that chance. You just won't get caught. Yeah. Back to dress code, because this is something I, you know, when I was first like out of undergrad interviewing for real jobs, um, it was something that I stressed about a lot. Well, how do you know what's the right thing to wear? And at least for me, um, I would err toward overdress. Um, and so I've gone on interviews where I was wearing a suit and my interviewer was wearing, you know, jeans or khakis. And I don't, if it were me, I wouldn't ever count someone off for being slightly overdressed. Whereas if you show up wearing jeans and you miscalculated that, that would definitely be a detractor. Well, you guys covered the, ne the next one, which was, uh, what do you recommend wearing to an interview? <laughs> so if you want to expand on that, you're more than welcome to. Well, I think just to add on, you don't want to, I wouldn't be flashy. Don't be flashy. Air on conservative and slightly overdressed. Yeah, in business, again, it, it, it just depends on your context. But in business, we always used to say, own the blue suit own the navy blue suit and the black pumps, and you can't go wrong with a classic, right? So, um, yeah. Totally agree. So what are some of the best questions you've heard from an interviewee? I have to say, at least from, from my perspective, when you, when you look at their business, it has to be a deep question. And what I mean, a deep question related to the business, like, um, I had a person asking me one day, hey, specifically, so you're in the aerospace sector and you guys repair aircraft components, you know, jet engine components and aircraft structure components. Um, the business cycle is in a low, um, is in a low at this time. When do you believe or think that the industry is going to take a turn and how would that affect you and have you prepared for that turn? Is that that's, so that tells me that they looked at my industry. That tells me that they look at the product that we produce. That tells me that the person did some research related to the to the to the industry, and they had to do some research to find out where that industry in the cycle was. I have to say, those are the people that I will say, "Wow, this is the guy I want to hire," because this guy will be paying attention. Right? He knows how to do the research, and. Me as an executive, if I get in trouble, you're going to let me know before I get in trouble. That would be my opinion. Yeah. Um, I don't have a... What we do at the NAC is, it's kind of hard to explain. <laughs> it's, you know, we do research, research uh, insurance regulatory research. Um, and I'm always impressed when someone comes into an interview and has taken the time to peruse our website and figure out exactly what it is that we do. Because um, it's not it's not simple like, you know, everybody knows what a public library does for the most part, but the NAIC, you know, you get I get blank books 
a lot. And so if you can demonstrate a level of understanding about what the job is, what the business does, um, that's what's impressive. Yeah, and I would add two things to that. Number one, always have a few questions in your pocket. You'll frequently get the question, or if you don't, you should be prepared to bring it up. What have I not asked you that you'd like to share? You should always have something. Well, I can't think of anything. That's not a good answer. Um, you should always have something in your pocket, and you should always have um, something deeper, as you know. Uh, and in fact, looking at the web pages, understanding what's going on. If you're in a public library and you're applying for a children's position, you could look at the website and say, "I see you had Mr. Stinky Feet last week. How was your attendance? How?" Is it growing? Is that what you know? What's happening in a good way there? And and what what do you perceive that I can do to make it better? Those kinds of engaging questions that, that again they they create real conversation around the topic of your employment. Question I like and I have used in interviews is what's on your list that you never seem to have time to get to a big project or something because that'll kind of show you where the organization's values lie. Um, and that's always been a revealing one for me. I just had a really good question in an interview and it was, if you hire me for this position, what are going to be my top three priorities in the next six months? Oh, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. And that showed me that they were thinking that they were going to get the job, number one, and, and they were thinking ahead about what's, you know, what, what am I getting myself into? So, so I thought that was a really good question. I have a question. Um, this is kind of to get a story. Um, my husband's a police officer, and I know there's this program called Earn Your Badge, where um, people wanting to get into the industry can um, like go through and see interview questions and kind of prep themselves to get into that interview. And then um, when he, my husband, is a supervisor. If he goes into an interview, he has questions that he's able to ask. Is there something like that set up for libraries? Kansas Where Library Association, kind of get, yeah. They have okay. a mentor program. They have nine mentors listed out on the website, and they will work with you on interview skills. Well, and then certainly anybody in the Sloan program, we have career services department. And even if you're a distance student, which I, I think no one here is, I think, although I know I heard someone earlier really apply to Europe for that. Um, even if you're a distance student, you know, because of technology, they can help you uh, answer questions, help you with your resume, help you with your CV, whichever you're writing. Um, so you should really take advantage of what's here for you at the university, too, especially since you're paying tuition. I'll say when, when they ask you a question, um, just make sure you're prepared to answer the question. And by that is, just don't answer yes or no. Um, Kind of state your state your answer in a short in a short brief. Uh, I'll say um, answer where between thirty seconds, no more than a minute. But it kind of give you the logic of hey, yes. So you're asking me this. These are the example exact examples I have done, and this is what I have learned. So it's always good because that that tells the person okay. So this person thinks logically. It's analytical, they really learn, and this is what they learn, and that's what they're going to go apply next. I think that's really on point, and I would add, don't be afraid to say, that's a great question. Let me think about it just one minute. And, you know, don't spend a whole minute, because it's very time down a whole minute. It lasts a lot longer than a minute. But um, take a minute to compose yourself and answer the question. Don't just let your mouth fall over and words come out. It, no one will mind if you say, oh, that's a good question, and you give yourself a minute to, to compose. Most of us in the library world are introverts. This is a problem we understand. <laughs> Having to take a minute and collect your thoughts, there's nothing, nothing, nothing wrong with it. it really. yeah. And after the interview, should you send a thank you? And if so, would, would it be best to do a handwritten thank you, an email, a phone call? What would you recommend? Or is it not necessary at this time? I'll, I'll talk to myself. At least the, the best that I have seen, um, the best practices is like the, the person comes in, they interview, 
I've seen them engage, they take notes, right, as we go. And when they send me a note, usually an email, it's a very brief email thanking me, but they really took the time to put like one or three things uh, of the actual interview. So I know that they were really paying attention. And if somebody blew it on something, like totally blew it, like I saw a guy that he he recovered nicely. He said, "Hey, listen, I don't think I explained myself well on this question, but here here's a here's a document explaining well the work that I have done. I kind of cleared the water for him, and I hired him. So, but it was it was interesting to see that he was paying attention. He was writing. He was able to." put some notes from that interview into the email and something that he did, he knew he did wrong, kind of clear it up by giving me some substantial, I'll say evidence that he had some. And he did it quick. So he did it within, I'll say, maybe less than 24 hours. So I knew he couldn't prep that up overnight. Yeah, I don't particularly care about the method, although I don't like phone calls. As I said. Um, but email or handwritten, either way, it's fine. But I think, you know, be prepared to drop it in the mail or, or send that email within about two days. I like the 24 hour time frame. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I very much agree with the fact that this is your chance to sort of seal the deal. This Seriously. is your chance to say, yeah. um, you know, these are the things we discussed and these are my strengths for this position. Um, that this that's a great place to do that. Just three quick bullets or one, one two, three, but wherever you found alignment. Um, and I don't think it matters. I don't want the phone call either. I have to say I'm yeah, totally agreement right. with that. Um, you want a paper trail, much easier. Um, but within 24 hours, that and and I think it is. You know, we we've kind of gotten away from thank you notes as a society, yes. but I think in the business world, you really have to pay attention to those kinds of. All right, well, that's all the questions that I had. Does anybody else have any? Um, what would you say would be a good way to nail a phone interview before you actually have the actual face-to-face? -face? I have to say, this is the toughest one. Yeah. Because uh -huh. they're not seeing you unless you're face on Skype. Now they just start. Well, it, it kind of depends on who the phone interview is with. A lot of times, those are with the HR department, with just a random recruiter. Um, and if, if that's the case, what that recruiter is looking for is, um, do your qualifications meet the job description? That's really it. That's what they're looking for. And so you need to speak, um, try and keep the jargon out of it because an HR recruiter may not really understand the ins and outs of the job, but you need, really need, need to speak to, this is the experience and education I have, and here's how it meets what you are looking for, and, and you know, be pretty direct. Usually those are fairly short, I think. Um, so you at least figure out who, who it is you're gonna be talking to. Uh, I think that's pretty important. This might sound weird, but um, when I had a phone inter interview, I dressed for an interview. I had my notes all ready, just as I would for an interview. I treated it like an in-person interview, I just kind of so I have read some studies just to her point where it says that you should dress up like if it were an interview. Just prep the same because like you may not notice, but the way your voice is coming across, it will come across more formal. Um, and you could read all these stories out there, but um, there's a lot of studies that say that. So I mean, it's, it's spot on. I will say that you have to be calm let them leave. And usually they're gonna leave like, hey, how are you? And they're just trying to be friendly just to break the ice, to just follow the script with them and then ask them some questions. Hey, so where are you based at? Oh, I'm based out of, um, let's say, Kansas City. So how's the weather out there? So try to break the ice because it's awkward for them and it's awkward for you. So you just wanna make sure that awkwardness goes out as soon as you can, so then you can focus on what you were saying on the actual job. But I would say just try to go, let them leave, break the ice, dress formally, and then once it's that out of the way and you feel more comfortable, so then you know you go in and do the, the 
formal part. Anything else? So the, yeah, I do have a question. Um, when, and this is kind of not just in the job interview, but also in the job searching part. Um, when you're reading about the job, it looks like a good fit, and it says salary commensurate with experience. How do you know which job to apply to? Because job applications are very time consuming, and you don't want to apply for a job that's going to come in at a lower salary than you're already getting, for instance. How do you handle that? How do you find out? One thing that I, again, I've just personal experience that I have done in the past is call HR and ask if they can tell us how we would deal with them um, so that I can make that evaluation. Another thing is, you know, you should already have in your mind in terms of what you feel your best fit might be in terms of location, you know, because that makes a big difference. Um, $50,000 job in Emporia is not the same thing as a $50,000 job in Los Angeles, right? So, you know, you have to have some kind of feel for that uh, as well. Um, but I would say... It wouldn't be frowned upon to call the HR department and ask what the salary range was? I mean, many here at the university, the salaries here are open record, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, again, it depends on the institution and so forth. We're nonprofit, so ours are too, so, mm -hmm. yeah. So, but if, you're, but if you just call HR and you see this position posted, Robin, how would you take that? Well, it, it has been a struggle as some of the public library directors here in the state of Kansas have had long discussions about on Facebook and elsewhere that the trend seems to be to not post the salaries for director's positions, and we're not sure where that's coming from. So we know that the public library statistical reports are mounted on the state library website, so we know we can go there and, and see what the last director was making. So that's kind of a, a hint, but that doesn't mean that that's what you could be offered. Um, but it, it is a struggle in some public libraries because there's been a couple of positions that have been open in the last six months to a year that they just aren't, they're not gonna tell you what the uh, salary is until they make the offer. Um, wow. and that's very difficult for people who are looking for a public so, library director position and don't know. We've done the same thing here in academia and I so disagree with that. I say post the salary or a range. Or give us an idea, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Because there's, there's master's level positions that are all the way from 34,000 in the state of Kansas to whatever. I mean, it it's just doesn't seem right to, to expect people to apply for positions that don't, that don't meet their needs. As an insurance librarian, I would also be remiss if I didn't say that your benefits and your other benefits, um, you know, count just as much as that salary number. I had a job offer not too long ago that was slightly more than I was making salary-wise, but when I looked at the benefits package, it was half the amount of time off I was already getting. The premiums for health insurance were more expensive. The retirement wasn't as good. And so you have to do that math. That's a great point. That is a really good math. point. Yeah. And a lot of times HR departments are really forthcoming with their benefits package. So that's absolutely a fine question to ask right up front. Then you talk, I think the answer is the salary piece. Now I'll say when you're doing the job search, one of the things, so, that people are doing these days, and you can read this everywhere, um, go to Glassdoor and, and try to find out if they're in Glassdoor, if there is any comments related to the company, uh, positive or negative, right? Because they could pay you, let's say if you're targeting a job that's paying $60,000 or $75,000, and this company is gonna be paying you $120,000, and the culture is a disaster. I was like, just stay away from it. Money is not everything in life. Mm -hmm. So I would, I would be very cautious. What I tell people is it doesn't matter. I'd rather get paid $50,000 less and be happy in a job that I could really progress and grow because you will grow and they'll recognize you and they'll take care of you. Uh, that's a place where they're going to take care of you at first, take care of you. Um, and then the culture is not your culture. and next thing you know you're quitting within six months potentially you're going to be burned out so because it could cause you a problem at your current job mm -hmm. if you you know didn't get any information about a, a 
a job and then they called for references and that's first your your current employer finds out that you're not maybe not happy in your job position or you're looking for something else and so that could cause future problems for you if you didn't get the job or if they offered you too little and you declined the job i don't think there's anything wrong in saying in an interview please don't let my current employer know that I, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with that okay. and if you don't want them to be called then don't just tell them a that reference. the hiring party yeah doesn't want to be wrong right um, I, and if they do maybe they don't work here yeah but no they, they don't want to do bad for toward you so, but you do need to be up front and, and share that say I have a position now um, I'm not sure if this will be the right step for me, so please don't contact anyone at my company. Here are my references. I have plenty of references for you, but please don't contact me. And that's not viewed as suspicious on no. that end? Because no. no. I've always been concerned that if I say, please don't contact, that's going to look like it's I have a bad situation or something. The only thing that would be a red flag for me is if you said, don't contact this employer three employers ago. Exactly. If exactly. it's your current employer, I don't, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, we saw that, again, going back to these interviews that we just did to hire professors, um, we had exactly this, this situation come up, that somebody had already had a teaching job, and so they just asked that we not contact that group. And we were fine with that. So, no, uh, so, no, sometimes no. it can be a red flag, though, if I see in the... They're like they're not employed right now, and it says why were you you know why were you terminated or you know something about the termination and then it says don't contact my last employer. That's a red flag. Yes, it is. That's it. So, but but if you're working somewhere and you don't want and you're looking for something better, that's just kind of sort of expected. Um, and and I would expect not to be able to contact somebody and rock their boat. So. I'll say one of the questions that are the toughest to answer is when they ask you, what has been the most significant mistake you have done in your professional career? So I'll say you always be, be, always think about that, that that question is coming your way. Because the moment whoever is in that other side is he's gonna ask you and you wanna give them a good answer, uh, a truthful answer, but a good answer. You don't wanna tell them, hey, I messed up this, I messed up that. And this, cause a bigger mistake, but what I want to hear is your thought process. We all made mistakes as professionals. It doesn't matter, everybody in this room has made a mistake. Just state the mistake, state what was the issue, what you learned from it, and why, what are you doing different today? So as a, as a professional, you kind of grew from that experience, right? You, you grew as a professional, and now you're applying all the lessons learned that you learn, but um, I'll say, I'll cautious everybody just to make sure they do know, they do have an answer to that question, prepare prior to that question coming your way, because those, those, those are tough questions. But most likely you will hear that question. Yes. And if you're not ready to answer. Then you're <laughs> it's obvious. It is. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, thank you. Okay. The recording stopped here.